school board meeting on August 11th at 7.03, if we could rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Community. Um, we lost a student um, this summer, um, Cassidy Carter, who was a student at Lighthouse Elementary. Um, she unfortunately succumbed to a cancer diagnosis, and we just wanted to have a moment of silence for her and her. Berkmeyer, here. Moses, here. Green, he is excused. Richards, here. Jabru, he is also excused. Middle staff, and I believe he will be a little bit late. And Knox, yes. Great. Right. Um, next, we are going to approve the agenda. Before we um, go through, I guess I'm going to explain our agenda. I know it's a little. Uh, a little bit different tonight um, than we've done in the past. Uh, what we're working towards, um, Mr. Jankowski and myself, um, we, our plan is, is, you know, there, you might notice some changes with maybe only one um, public comment on the agenda and um, a different in format with new business and um, a few other things. What the plan we have is that in the future, um, moving forward, you know, we won't be voting on new business and things generally in the same meeting um, that it's introduced. So by doing that, we feel we could eliminate the need for two public comments. Um, if you follow the meetings, you'd be able to you know, hear about news um, in one meeting um, or perhaps watching on Zoom to go back and watch and no, no action will generally be taken until the following meeting at least, if not maybe even further meetings down the road. So um, in doing that, we feel like um, we can give the community a little bit of time to understand as well um, for things to sink in with ourselves and for the community and that we won't need to do public comment twice within a meeting. Um, there's also a few other changes um, just you know, towards the end. We're gonna move our superintendent's update earlier in the meetings. So sometimes that might quell some concerns or questions that people might have earlier. Um, and so that people can either move on with their evening or um, you know, follow up with their comments afterwards. So um, there's a few changes on the agenda. Try to bear with us a little bit. And um, hopefully you will see in the next few meetings that things kind of roll a little smoother and that um, you'll understand kind of why we, we, we decided to go this direction. Okay, so what we'll do next is um, an approval of the agenda. Um, is there a motion to approve <coughs> the agenda as presented? I'll make a motion. I will second. Okay, any discussion? Go ahead and call the roll then. Berkmeyer? Yes. Moses? Yes. Uh, Richards? Yes. Knox? Yes. Okay, motion passes. Um, so we'll move on. Um, Mr. Jankowski for the superintendent's update. Okay, superintendent's update. Just to give you some things that we've been working on and, and um, some questions that we had. Scheduling and staffing. Um, we're continually monitoring the elementary class sizes um, in order to make 
make sure that we're keeping classes at an acceptable level, especially in light of um, COVID concerns and so on. So we are adding sections right now. We're on the cusp of it might we might have to add as many as six more um, sections across the buildings in order to make sure that we're keeping things. Um, but we would use the ESSER funding for that. Um, we've been we've reviewed the band and music staffing. Um, unfortunately, with the way that the county does scheduling, once you commit the schedule, you go from what's called mass scheduling to walk-in. And it's just because band goes into the schedule first and it's a larger class and just the implications, it would be very difficult to move those sections around. We have um, added a part-time choir position based off of um, student enrollment. And our, our plan is if that, if the elementary numbers continue in the direction that they're headed, then we would probably have to expand it even more in order to cover the specials because that would just cover the core classes. It wouldn't cover the specials for that. So we'd have to do some um, juggling there in order to cover it. Um, enrollment. Well, enrollment, I'll tell you, oh, yeah, there you go. It, we are slightly up at this point over where we ended last year. Still down from two years ago, but it, it's we, we're seeing more people return. School choice numbers are trending ahead of where they have been in previous years, I'm told. So currently we have 66 school choice students um, at the elementary level and 11 at the secondary level. And we're really starting to hit kind of the, the peak window right now. So we'll see how that plays out. Then we meet weekly with the health department. Today was our meeting. This is the latest update. Um, local numbers continue to be lower than at any point since March of 2020. So they're still in mask recommendation mode. Um, masks are required on buses. Quarantines right now, they're still in effect at 10 days. They are anticipating having a meeting this Friday, they said with the state and um, federal level. So they might make some adjustments to those. Currently, if you are vaccinated, you do not have to do the 10 day quarantine. However, they might adjust that to where you would be quarantined for 10 days, but if you, after five days, you can have a negative test and you could return. They're also looking at um, adjusting the, based off of the distances um, in order to, so if it's, if you're contact tracing, the, the three foot and then six foot would be based off of who had just to, they want to encourage more masks because that's a recommendation. So if two people had masks and they're within three feet, they wouldn't have to quarantine if one had it based off of their recommendation. That toolkit they anticipate being revised after this meeting on Friday, and we should see that next week. The big concern, and this is the concern with all districts, is the, the learning loss, especially in reading. We, we have, well, this is the, the, you can show that one. That's the, uh, this is the cases from the beginning. Um, they share this data with us. And you can see on the far left, this is um, March when it first started. So all the way back to March 1st of 2020. And then now you can see we're below, we're about a third of the cases where they've been at. And most of the cases that they've seen in the last week have been at the south end of the county. Here, um, they, they give us data by zip code. And so for our district, they've been um, very minimal. They also, the capacity for, um, they share with us hospital capacity and so on. And uh, there's been just very slight uptick in um, use of hospital for, for cases of COVID. But, but again, going back to the whole concept of learning loss, this has been the major struggle most districts, this is always the, the conversation because it's the reason that they have the third grade reading laws because they know by the time a student hits third grade that it it affects so much of their um, future. Uh, based on if they're on track in third grade, it's their lifetime earnings, their ability to graduate, their degrees, and so on. So it's trying to trade both of those off. The best example I've heard was. 
right after 9-11 when they changed all the security procedures at the airports and everything. They said, well, that was to try and prevent another 9-11 and save X number of lives. But the unintended consequence of that is now you have more people driving on the roads. And so then traffic fatalities went up. So by making one, you're just really transferring problems elsewhere. Uh, and so that's, that's really the conundrum that districts are in is because imagine if you are a third grader this year in the most important year of all, you have been under COVID pretty much since you got out of kindergarten. And it's just, a, it's a huge impact on that critical period of learning. And that's the health problem. There's very few case, cases coming out of elementary, even before that's one thing they, they talked about with before the mask mandates. So that's kind of where they're basing their decision on, and you know that they're not shy about if they feel that there has to be a mandate and they've taken their heat on it, then they'll put one back in. But right now, they're they're still just it's masks are recommended. There there's no mandate for those, only on buses. Any questions? Just one quick question. Um, do we monitor the number of anchor based students that are picking school choice in other school districts? Yes, we we track that as much as possible. And, and I know, is that something that we see increasing or decreasing? Do you know after that? You, we won't know yet. You typically will not know until um, right after, it's typically the week or two after count day, then they, the state will update that. It's the caveat to the enrollment. You will not, you do not know who's going elsewhere until we, the first day of school and we have had count. Um, the only way we know, and I think we've had a handful so far, where if they're doing schools of choice and they have to get their discipline record, if the school requires it, and so then we'll get a records request. Otherwise, it's not until after the first day of school that we get those. And then that's, then we typically do not know where they're headed necessarily. Um, after that, if they move or some other reason until um, the state does the count day, and then they'll put that on the My School Data website. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we'll move on to um, public comment. And I just had one submission. Uh, today from Mr. Tom Braun regarding um, Dan. You got the bottom one. Hello. All right. Good afternoon. Um, again, I just wanted to follow up with our the last Board of Education meeting. Um, we came, there was, a, there was a large group of parents that came and expressed concern about the scheduling at the high school for the band program. Um, we we talked about even the middle school level with the choir and, and what's happened over the last couple of years. Um, it was my understanding when we left that meeting after the, the board had their closing comments and board members said administration find a solution to the problem for these families, these parents, bring it to us. If it means spending money or hiring teachers, whether it be band required teachers or teachers, other teachers, so that, you know, to free up to make more room in the schedule, you know, they would do that. <clears throat> After we left the meeting, Mr. McDonald and I had a conversation and he said that he's going to look into it and try and have it resolved and give me an answer in a few days. Um, it was not a few days, it was not a few weeks. Um, but after a couple email communications, he basically emailed back and said that there was no simple solution to this problem. So what I'm getting at is I didn't think there was gonna be a simple solution. I don't think any of the parents that came to the meeting to express their concerns thought it was gonna be a simple solution. Um, again, this is a program that's been running here for, this is an outstanding band program that's been running here for 20 plus years, 26 years, I think Bizno is here. So I just want the board to know that I don't feel <clears throat> from my point of view that it was taken. I, I just don't know what was done on that end. 
Um, there was very, very limited communication with me. Um, Mr. McDonald did say that he was going to, you know, keep me updated on it so that I could inform all the parents that are in the band, right? Because I talk to most of them regularly. Um, which brings me to last week. We had our band camp uh, for marching band. It was an extremely successful week with our new band directors. Um, very impressed with everything that happened throughout the week. The kids behaved perfectly. Um, everything went off without a hitch, no behavior problems, nothing like that. We had our performance on Friday, at our own stadium, and it was amazing. Um, we filled the, the people that came to watch filled just about, I'd say 80, 90% of the, the grandstand there. So it was really cool to see the kids did an amazing job. And uh, I think it went off very successfully. So um, I know some of us, I know some of the board members were there, um, some couldn't make it, but it was a really amazing, amazing week for the kids and for the new staff members and that ending performance that just went off so awesome. I think it gave a good feel for the for the parents of the program and the, and the grandparents of the program to see think you know, programs in the right hands. Um, so I found out Mr. Flory told me about an hour before I left my job today that you're gonna be presented for hiring a band teacher at middle school North. Um, again, you know, I, I, I reached out to human resources department, um, just to find out where we were at with that, especially after the last board meeting. And, uh, I did get a response. Uh, the response did not say anything about what the plan was, uh, just that we were going to review things. So, you know, um, with the hiring of Mr. Flory, I asked admin if I could be involved in that process and Mr. Viznot, the outgoing band teacher, be involved in that process, which which, which happened. I was involved in it, Mr. Viznot was involved in it. Um, Mr. Orenchek and Mr. Viznot were involved in the hiring of the band teacher for Middle School South. Um, and I, I kind of expected that the new music staff, at least Mr. Flory at the high school director of bands um, would be involved in it. And, and he wasn't at all. So I just want to make sure that that's out there. But um, I believe you're going to be presented with Mr. Scott Hawkins. Uh, Scott comes from a family of band directors and musicians and is a graduate from Plymouth Canton Schools, a district well known for having a dynamite band program. He went to Wayne State University where he played in the top ensembles and was a soloist. He taught middle school in Taylor, in Taylor, Michigan before directing in Ypsilanti, and he is a professional tuba player. He performs with local bands like Plymouth Community Band and the Vanguard Brass. Impressively, he was a member of the marching band Major League Drum Corps International. Um, in the organization of Phantom, Phantom Regiment, sorry. Um, he is a highly qualified, he's highly qualified and would be a great addition to our music team at Anchor Bay. Um, on behalf of myself and, and Mr. Flora, we do recommend it, hiring Mr. Hawkins. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I have no other submissions for public hearing. Um, we're going to move on to communications um, to enter into the record. Yes, you have one communication is from the auditors. This is their engagement letter to um, basically talking about the process of the years of the audit and really looking for if there's any information that, that you want them to look at or anything so you can, um, Lisa and I met with them on the first day that they were here so they can, they can include their on-site work, but if you, this will be part of the final packet and They'll be doing that probably over the next six weeks or so, and then I would anticipate seeing that at the end of September, probably. Okay. That's just for review. Mm -hmm. We'll move on to the consent agenda. So these are going to be items, you know, that are going to recurring vote on every meeting, um, former meeting minutes, um, personnel reports, and financial reports so that we kind of live group together and as a consent, um, one item that we can just vote on yes or no. If any board member at any point 
um, at the start of the meeting prior to approving the agenda, if they would want any of these items pulled out so that they're voted on separately, all you have to do is request and that's what we would do. Um, it doesn't require a vote. So, um, so for tonight, we have the consent agenda, which includes the approval of the June 23rd um, budget hearing. If you remember, there were two meetings, so the budget hearing and the regular meeting minutes, um, as well as the new personnel report, uh, which includes some new hires for the new year, and as well as the financial report. Um, so is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll make the motion. Second, I will second. Okay, um, and then any discussion? Okay, hearing none, we can call the roll. Berkmeyer? Yes. Mr. Richards? Yes. Mr. Moses? Yes. Myself? Yes. Okay. Motion passes. All right, so moving on to new business, um, we have the annual uh, school loan revolving fund application and resolution. Okay, yeah, the, the rationale for the school bond loan revolving fund is uh, it, it's a self sustaining fund that makes loans to the school districts to assist with making debt service payments on state qualified bonds issued under the school bond qualification and loan program. Any money repaid by school districts on loans made by the school loan revolving fund are deposited back into the fund for future use by other districts. These loans are used to allow districts to make full debt service payments rather than increase its current debt millage, thereby reducing taxes on the community. This year marks the end of the draw phase of the loan and the beginning of the repayment phase. So the recommended action is that the Board of Education approve the application resolution for participation in the school bond loan revolving fund. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the application for participation in the school bond loan revolving fund? I'll go ahead and make that motion. <laughs> I'll second. Okay, so motion by Mr. Richards by Mr. Moses. Any discussion? Okay, go ahead and call the roll. Ms. Berkmeyer? Yes. Mr. Moses? Yes. Mr. Richards? Yes. Myself? Yes. Okay. Motion passes. Uh, the next Items are tentative agreements that were reached. Um, do you want to go through these one at a time? You you have to vote on them one at a time, but we can do the rationale if you want. There, it's the same basically. Okay, go ahead. Okay, rationale for for these staff reports are: the administration has entered into a tentative agreement with the Anchor Bay Administrators Association, um, the Administrators Association of District Office Administrators, and the Anchor Bay Administrators Association of Supervisors and Coordinators regarding their wage reopener for the past school year of the 2020-21 school year. This agreement is similar to the recently ratified teachers agreement and was in, within budget. Recommended action is that the Board of Education approve the tentative agreement for these three groups um, because they're within budget. Okay, so let's start, um, we'll start with the Anchor Bay Administrators Association of District Principals and Assistant Principals with the Board of Education. Is there a motion to accept um, this tentative agreement? I'll make a motion. Is there a second? I will second. And any discussion? Go ahead. Ms. Berkmeyer? Yes. Mr. Moses? Yes. Mr. Richards? Yes. Myself? Yes. Motion passes. And the next one is with the Anchor Bay Administrators Association of District Office Administrators with the Board of Education. Is there a motion to accept uh, this tentative agreement? I'll make a motion. I will support. And any discussion? 
discussion? Ms. Berkmeyer? Yes. Mr. Moses? Yes. Mr. Richards? Yes. Myself? Yes. Okay, motion passes. And last but not least, um, the Anchor Bay Administrators Association of Supervisors and Coordinators with the Board of Education. Is there a motion to accept this tentative agreement? I'll make a motion. I will support. And any discussion? Okay. Mrs. Berkmeyer? Yes. Mr. Moses? Yes. Mr. Richards? Yes. Myself, yes. Okay, also passes. So thank you to all of those groups. Okay, um, next we are moving to the student achievement and curriculum portion of the meeting. Um, so Mr. Jankowski has a presentation regarding uh, student growth for us tonight. Okay, if I can draw your attention to the screen, hopefully my remote will work here. I apologize if this is a little too uh, in depth, but I just wanted to kind of give you a, a background. On, um, I'd mentioned like in the interview process that growth is kind of the name of the game. And I wanted to give you the board and the community just a background on why that is and where we're going. And this is really going to kind of lay the groundwork for a lot of work that um, we plan on doing in the next few years. So if you were to look at these two schools, so you have school one and school two, you can see the arrows, which school, which school do you feel is performing better? So the bottom of the arrow would be where the, the score started. Top the arrow would be where the scores are. The yellow line would be the proficiency bar at the top. Currently, what most districts are looking at and what the traditional um, school rating system was, it would be the one on the left because they're counting the number of arrows that are above the proficiency. So that district would, has, they're up in five areas, there would be the better one. However, if you look at the amount of growth for school two, higher growth, but lower scores, it's which one is really doing the better job with the students. And so how do you kind of quantify that? And we can even take this down to a, a class level. So if you look at teacher one and teacher two. So if you look at proficiencies, the green bar, you can see growth is the distance between the gray bar and then that's the previous year score for a student. And then the yellow bar is the, the following year's score. Again, under the traditional model, teacher two would be considered the, the better teacher in the state rank, ranking system because four of the students, so 80% of the students are above the proficiency level. However, if you look at those, most of those students are treading water, basically. They're not making growth. They're not getting close to that proficiency line. And some of them actually are sliding back a little bit. So again, if your child was in that classroom, which teacher would you prefer? The traditional measure of success has been proficiency. So kind of stealing the uh, from the Olympics, it's like the high jump. They'd set a bar and they just would count how many kids are getting over that bar. And no accounting for the background of students. But learning is really a journey. And we know students come to us at different spots and so if we're just using it's one bar for them to get over or one line for them to cross and we're going to say whoever crosses it first or how many kids cross it in a set number of days or, or school years is that a true measure of success for a district because proficiency alone gives a false sense of security a lot of times if you can say well you know my student was proficient so i feel good but if they're not making progress and they're not moving ahead it, they're not getting challenged and ready for the next level. So the state has changed a few years ago. This is the percentages that they use for the school index. So you can see student growth is number one. 
just over a third of the grade is based on student growth. Proficiency is still important, but it's second. Then they have the other aspects that are significantly less important. They're still important though, school quality, student success, graduation rate, English learner progress, general assessment participation, and your English learner participation. So this has been the new discussion and you might have heard this a few years ago, the, the difference between proficiency and growth. So proficiency is just a, it's a status in time. It's kind of like, we're gonna take this one moment in time, look, see where our students are at, and then just make a judgment on that. It's not looking at it over the course of the year. Are you adding value to that? Are you moving students further ahead? Um, so the growth model, it, you have to use systematic methods. You need multiple times and points, you, and you have to have a distinction between those different points. So this kind of ties into, especially the um, administrator evaluation component. It's created by a gentleman named Doug Reeves, and they basically look at it like this. It's, and you'll see this over and over again as I show you the next um, set of data where there's two mechanisms for this. You can have your achievement of results. So are you hitting that proficiency level? Is it high or low? And then what is your, your kind of growth? And so they basically break districts into four different categories where you can have high results and you know where what's kind of going on. So you're a leading district. You can be a learning district. So you have low results, but you understand why you're getting low results. It's just what can move you forward. You can be a lucky district where you're getting high results, but you really don't know why. It could just be demographics. It could be, um, you know, you have certain programs that are going well, but you're not measuring them accordingly. Or you could be losing district where you have low results and you have no concept. So again, the, the challenge is, okay, if growth is the way we want to go, growth is in the eye of the beholder. So this started, Stanford did a research study a few years ago, and they've been updating this. It lags a little bit behind, just so you know. And you can look this up online. It's called the Stanford Opportunity Explorer. And basically any district in the entire country, you can go to that district, you can click on the map, and you can, it'll tell you all about them based off of, this is just for elementary and middle school. So for Anchor Bay, we have, tells you there on the left-hand side, test scores are higher than the US average. Learning rates are roughly the same as US average, so it's 3%, so we're slightly above um, the average. Test scores are improving over time, which is good. Socioeconomic status is above average, and but overall, if you compare us to similarly situated socioeconomic um, districts, test scores are lower, learning rates are roughly equal, and test scores are improving faster, however. And it gives you a breakdown on all of that. So just grab three districts out of, um, just so you have a comparison. So first one is Armada, just to give you a comparison of average test scores a little bit higher, you can see socioeconomic status is a little bit lower. Learning rate, 11.1%, so it's considerably higher. And trends in test scores have been about a third higher as well. Third district I grabbed, just to show you that this is where you can be a lucky district. So gross point, significantly higher in socioeconomic status. More parents with college degrees. Test, score, test scores are typically higher but their learning rate has been negative. So their kids have been sliding year after year. You can break this down on the building level as well. And I don't wanna run through all of these for the buildings, but it just kind of breaks it down. Um, it's interesting, not all of the data is there. If you look in like Macomb County, Richmond has a very high score, but they only have only one of their buildings is showing up in the data. They're not doing it from um, elementary through middle school. I think it's their elementary is not showing up in the data. And it's hard. It's hard. There are not very many districts that are positive for every single building. Um, and you see that here as well. Most of our districts are well above, um, but we still have some areas which actually might surprise you if you, if you dig into the data. So that's one measurement of growth. 
The Mackinac Center does another one. They call it their CAP, Report Guardians Context and Performance Database. And now they're not looking at a full socioeconomic status. They're not looking at parent education level. They're not looking at it. This is only on your free and reduced lunch. So it's the last column over here. So based off of that, they're comparing, they're only taking if the percentage of kids that are on free and reduced lunch, and then they're comparing your scores to other districts that are similarly situated. And then they, they give a grade on that. And you can see this is much different than the way that Stanford has done it. And this is really the, the challenge here. How do you compare like apples and oranges when you're looking at growth? How do you kind of bring this together so that it's consistent? So the state has been working on this. Um, they have multiple, there's actually three systems at the state that they do this. There's a school index, there's a school report cards, and then now they've been doing this one for about five years now. It's the EVAS system. It's the Education Value Added Assessment System. This is not released publicly. This is something that um, they just do behind the scenes right now. My anticipation is you will probably see this um, pub publicized, I'd say probably in five to seven years. And they drill this down all the way to the teacher level if you sign up for it right now, it's voluntary. But ultimately, um, there's a famous example was in California, they use this, a similar system, and then they actually, the papers get it and they publish it in the paper. But it's, and you can see it's a different, we're, we'll dig into how they use that. By and large, most of our buildings do very well in most grades and subject matters. The, the center line is the 50th percentile either green box on either side is either a negative one or a positive one in growth. So it's 50 percentile. They give you this range to be 1% less or above. Then light blue, you are 2% above. Dark blue, you're 3% above. And if they do this where they add the little crescent at the end, you're well above. So they have to kind of extend the graph for it. And you can see right now, 80% of these, we're on the right side. We have some work to do when we start kind of digging into it at other levels. And likewise, they, the nice thing about this is they break it down. So you can look at different buildings and kind of see where they're at, see your areas. You can even dig in a little bit further. So this is based off of quintile. So you can see your highest quintile where students are at and how are they doing based on the previous year growth. They only do this for subjects where they have adjoining scores. So it starts in third grade, and then, so then you'll have it in fourth grade, fifth grade, and so on. And they'll do it based off of test proficiency. So you can see, we do very well with the students who, this is the last year that they had scores from 2019. So the students who are not proficient, we did a great job moving kids from not proficient to the partially proficient or proficient level. Another measurement that we use, this was, this has been used for about 10 years in the state of Michigan. Um, the state actually used this as, it's an approved benchmark. And this is North, it's NWA, it's their math assessment. We do this for reading and math. And so this is from, again, 2019, it's the last full year where we were able to test um, a large selection. So what they do is, they adapt this based off of similarly um, similar demographic districts and what you're looking at is this is your confidence interval with the diamond you your goal is to be at least touching the diamond so you're in that confidence interval and you can see um, typically because the content gets more difficult that's why the, the bars always go down but this that's kind of the national average and our goal is to kind of um, get to that point then there's the school index. So a lot of that data in the percentiles, so they break it up. This is where that report card actually gets um, put together. So you have an overall index score. So you can see Great Oaks and they do it for each building. So they're a 98.34 and their growth index, they were a hundred. So they hit their target and their proficiency index. So about, again, about 63% of their score comes from these two and that's in all you can see all of our elementary do exceptionally well here where they're almost in the 90th percentile overall based off that 
Secondary, typically, um, again, if you're above the 50th percentiles, you're improving. So we're in the top um, quartile for, at the high school and middle school north and south are both in the upper end as well. So student growth percentile is what these are based on. And this is a little bit different than what I showed you with um, the um, EVA, well not the EVA system, the Mackinac Center and the Stanford system. You might be most familiar with this if, if you have children where you go to the doctor and then they tell you what's their height, what's their weight, what's how do they fit on like the standard growth percentile. So the, the reason they did this is because that whole how do you weigh the demographics factor to it. Because we know now, especially if you track the SAT scores, parent educational level has greater impact than poverty level because for the SAT in some of those um, score areas like the, the advanced math and so on, if you have somebody in your house that has taken calculus, they're going to help you a lot more than if you're in a house that does not have somebody that's taken calculus. So the state wanted to find a way that how can we do that? Because oftentimes you had districts and teachers and so on that would say, it's not fair because we don't get the same funding. We don't get, we don't have like, you know, we might have less household income. So they wanted to find a way that you could compare kids on an individual level as much as possible. So growth percentiles, it's basically meant so that you're not a disagree where you're like, hey, our kids are doing well, they're all going, we're just going to coast and they'll still do well. They want you to find a way that you're going to challenge every kid. And basically, I like to call it it's productive struggle every day. We want every kid, regardless of where they're at. It's a new definition of an at risk. It's not, not the kids who are in the bottom 30%, it's any student that's not maximizing their potential. So this is kind of how, when they, they weigh those percentiles out, just so you can kind of see how that works. So they give you all of these scores, you have your targets, then they put the percentages on, that gives you your index, which gives you your score. This is how they break it down on a student level. So let's say third grade is the first grade where you can, if you get, let's say a three, so you are proficient on the test, then they're going to take that as your baseline. The next year, when that student's in fourth grade, they're going to say, okay, this student was a 3.4, so they're in the 70th percentile. If they were, say, a 2.4, they'd be in the 10th percentile. So then each student gets that score, they average that out across the teacher, across the classrooms, across the school, and then that's how you get your composite score. So let's kind of take this into an example of, let's just take a class, two kids in there, okay? So we have two fourth grade students, and this is, this is really where it kind of hits, um, where you can see why growth is such an important factor. So we're, we're going to have student A, fourth grade student, scored 14-14 on the state assessment. The way that they benchmark these, just so you know, 1400 is fourth grade, 1300 is the cut score for third grade, 1500 is the cut score. So they, they make it so they norm it back to the grade level. Student two, student B, same score, 1414. So if I look at the chart, I would say, okay, they're both proficient. They're both edging into even advanced. So we're doing well. Typically, you'd send the report home, parents would say, hey, they're proficient, I'm happy, that's what we want. We'd say, if I have this class and all my kids are proficient, that's great. So this now asks us to say, where were they last year? So let's look at their third grade test score. So again, we have student A, he was at 1357. Remember, 1300 is the cut score. So he was well above the cut score. Student B, 1279. She was below the cut score. So student B, dang it. student A, you can see is at the far end was advanced. Student B was below. So now what they do is they take that student. So student A, because this is the only way that they can do a direct comparison, is going to be compared to every single student. It's about 10,000 to 11,000 students in the state of Michigan that will be in any individual grade. 
So student A will be compared to every student who got that same score of 1357. And then they'll say, okay, let's put this on there. So he was at the fifth percentile for growth. Student B went all the way up and was in the 95th percentile. So again, now if we go back and we're looking at it with this kind of a better picture of learning, both students were proficient. That's great. So under the, this is where we have, would have stopped before. Both students made progress. Their scores were better the second year than before. So a lot of parents would look at it and say, okay, uh, I'm happy because you made growth. You went up, you know, you went up 57 points. She went up 135, but there's no context to that. It's not until you start looking at growth that you can see growth levels were vastly different. So what does this look like in the classroom? So what we do, and this is a sample report just that they give you from NW, and none of these are our students. This is from a, a fake elementary. When they, they can do a formative assessment with NWA, they can break out their class grouping. So basically what it does, it breaks it out by the different subject areas, if we give all of the tests, and then they know. So if I want to create groups of students, and if you want to do something like like a, a walk to read program where we, we want to really push these kids out of the upper end. So then maybe I'm going to take these kids, they're going to get with kids in another class at the high level. We're going to push them further today. And then that'll give me time to work with the students on the lower end because I really need to give them more time while these kids are off being challenged and moving ahead. Likewise, maybe today, I want to make sure that they're all on the same page. We know that one of the better ways to like have students, it, it's always, you, you know it, and then if you're able to teach it, then you really know it. So maybe I'm going to have them, these students work with the upper kids, and then now they can work on their skills and really kind of get that whole metacognition going of do I know why I know this and how it works. Again, it goes back to the same, you'll see this quadrant chart now playing out. So it's ach achievement and growth scale. And you constantly want to be in this quadrant one where you have higher achievement and higher growth. You, you're fine if you're getting um, high growth because over time that will just compound and it will work to where those students are, will eventually become proficient. So every single one of these kind of has the same report. So this is a scatter plot of every single school in the United States. And so you can see in comparison, the red dot right there, that's our district. So we're in the correct quadrant. We're moving in the right direction. Now our goal is we want to move more towards this kind of um, level. Now this is the EVAS system. This is individual buildings. This is just for the elementary um, because you can't get them on the same chart. I just want to give you an example. So these are the elementary, as you can see, we're at Achievement wise, we're at the nice end of the spectrum, but we have some work to kind of bump that up over um, with the growth index. You can drill this down even. So what NWA does is allows us to drill this down to a classroom level. So these are actual classroom data. So if I'm a teacher, I can pull this report and I can see where my students are. So if I'm a teacher, I can click on this student and see who that student is and see where they were the previous year and say, okay, where do I want them to go? So again, this is high achievement, high growth. On this one, because I flipped the uh, axis. So this is high, this is low achievement, high growth. And then this one's high achievement, but low growth. So these students were above the proficient line, but they're not making growth um, commensurate with their peers. And then students in the red, they're low achievement, low growth. Here's another class. So you can see this teacher, almost all of the students are in the high achievement, high growth. And the funny thing is, if you look at this, just because if this was just on the achievement, there's really not that much difference in the achievement level. But once you add that other aspect of growth, it, it just really gives you a more robust picture of um, what students are doing. So this is, it, it's a large concept for um, teachers and administrators and so on to kind of um, look at because it's a different way of looking at 
student achievement. Our first goal is to one, one of the issues we have because of um, not having enough technology devices that we couldn't test kids at for the, the NWA is kind of the formative assessment. So we want teachers to have that. So you can see there were some holes in the data there. We would be able to do those tests in the window, make it a little bit more standardized because each of those tests take about 20 minutes. So it's great for teachers to kind of get that. Um, but thankfully Tim pulled a miracle and was somehow, it was typically running six to nine months to get Chromebooks, but we were able to order some and we got them in today, right? You said we ended up getting all of the Chromebooks, so we should be good to go um, this year. Then it's, we have to just work through a process. It, this will take probably three to five years to kind of reorient around growth so we can train staff how to use the data and what does it mean? Because NWA will actually, you can drill down, I'll tell you, this student is missing on this standard right here. So work on this, they're, they're primed for this next, they're primed for this after that. And so it kind of helps you kind of develop your instruction. And we'll, the goal is to move away from what I call the one size fits all. It's like, we're doing this today and I know looking at scores, half of you probably already know this, but we're gonna do it anyhow, because that's where it's at. It's like, no, let's tailor the instruction to where those students are at. It might even mean moving some students up as they could, or bringing in additional resources for other people. So we'll analyze those gaps and we'll adjust accordingly. And then ultimately, um, again, because it works, it'll be included in evaluations for teachers or administrators, because that's kind of how that system was meant to, to be used. Any questions on this? I know it's a lot of data, um, and I know I promised that I wouldn't kill you with data, so I apologize. So you're looking to start implementing this this year? Not necessarily implementing. We're doing the, we're doing the assessments already. We've been doing them. This is really baseline. We have to, the state, The state requires us to do the benchmark assessments. They have certain deadlines that you have to do that. Um, it's basically data collection this year. It's just having those and then just getting the concept out there for people so that they can start thinking about that. Maybe sharing some of the data from before. And then our goal is in future years to start working on that because um, this year coming off of really the last year and a half, it's the, the fall is the kind of catch their breath. Let's kind of establish some kind of um, some, some sense of normalcy, we'll hope. And then we'll start making, we want to go through strategic planning, like I mentioned before, and then we'll really next year kind of roll this out the next step. Um, I really appreciate it, Dad. It was highly informative, so thank you. Um, what we hear a lot is uh, uh, teach to test. And what I'm seeing from what you just presented is that there's there's so much more that can go into it. Is, is that like where we're going and then helping our teachers find those individuals that need more growth and, and all of that? Yeah, it's really. It's a different way. It was presented differently than what I've always yeah, seen. The, the goal is what I like to compare to a medical model where you're not, you're not just saying, again, that this is, it's kind of like school lunches I always equate it to. Right now, like they have the things, hey, it's pizza today. You're getting pizza whether you need pizza or like pizza or want pizza, and you have to take the drink and the vegetables whether you're going to eat it. No, we can tailor that to what does the student need, where do they need help, and um, that it's just reorienting around to that, and so that we can kind of help each student kind of hit their, their growth. So I think the standardized tests are actually much more helpful than what I thought, maybe? Yeah, in, in this model, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, thank you. Um, so we will move to board comments. Um, I, what I will know um, for the audience, we do have uh, what will be starting a points of pride. Um, so it may limit our board comments a little bit. Um, but I wanted to keep this in here. Um, if board members, you know, wanted a chance to add something else um, that's going on or 
you know, explain, you know, their position on something or why they voted it away, um, that we can leave that in there for, for board members to do that. Um, I don't have any for tonight. Uh, Ms. Knox, do you have? Um, not really. It's just it's exciting seeing, um, you know, the band back on the field, the football players, the youth football players. Uh, it's very busy, um, and so that's that's nice to see again. And I'm really hoping it continues. I'm sure everybody is. That's all my comments for tonight, uh, Mr. Richards. Yeah, the only comments I have is, uh, you know, thank you, Mr. Jankowski. You know, it's been great having you on board. Um, you know, from day one, just the the weekly updates we get, very informative. Um, you know, great detail. Um, you know, looking forward to the school year. I'm sure uh, with a lot of students and teachers and uh, staff in the district, I'm sure they're very excited for the uh, school school to start up again. So I just uh, you want to say thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Middlestaff, did you have any? Yeah, I apologize for being late. Something came up, so I missed all the actions. It was only half an hour. I didn't miss a lot. So uh, just two comments is, um, and maybe you brought this up when I wasn't here, the non-instructional con uh, contracts, where we sit on those. And I know we gave $500 away to teachers, and mm -hmm. tonight I guess you must have given them administrators, but I'm just yeah. concerned that, because um, I mentioned to Todd earlier that I don't know why we couldn't have given everybody the $500 and then and got into the nitty gritty of all the other items on the contracts. I know we, we basically look at the teacher's contract Kind of figure out the percentages and then apply that to the other contracts. But yeah, I know. I, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit concerned that you know, that thing. We wait another two or three weeks. Why we couldn't have voted on providing five hundred dollars to every you know not everybody in the district and then finalize those contracts because now we waited that those people wait another half a month and we get them done by the end of the year. So what's the? Yeah, I understand. We we do have there will be another series for um, some of the non instructional that will be coming. At the next um, board meeting, and so each each group has been kind of working through like um, whether it's the five hundred or whether they want it in a different way based off of that dollar amount. Okay, All right. Uh, what was my other comment? The um, the elementary uh, class sizes. I know. Um, I think I talked to you this week about it, but I would think uh, we've got a lot of good, particularly in Aldrin, you know, because when we combine uh, Aldrin and Sugarbush. Eliminate a lot of teachers there, so and I, I did send a note. I know Lisa passed it on too to Todd. As I asked why uh, we're not using COVID funds to make these classes, especially last year, we missing an hour. This year, I would think we would try to utilize those COVID funds and try to minimize classes. Because I, I, at the lower L's, I wouldn't think we would want 29, 28 kids, mm -hmm. and then you're in the upper L, 30, 31 kids. We haven't had that in a long time. Yeah, well, now that we have COVID funds, I would think, okay, mm -hmm. yeah, in the past, we are tight on budget, we might have to push that through, but here we are, we've got COVID money available, I've got class sizes of 31 or 29 in the second grade, we should be pulling the trigger, I want to say, we should be executing something right now and say, all right, let's just get this done now and not wait another two or three weeks, because the sooner we can do that, the sooner the teachers can, we get them on board and get them prepared to get the classrooms I know, I know probably five to seven classrooms could use another teacher. Mm -hmm. right? And I, I don't think we should be waiting another week or two to, to do that. So I don't know what your perspective on it or whether you need more approval to go ahead and do that. But I, I just feel with the COVID funds, we should be doing whatever we can to help those kids that you know, had to endure all last year. And again, teachers also that they're coming back and certainly, you know, they're prepared to teach 31 in the classroom. And certainly everybody knows that if I've got 26 versus 31 in a school, it's gonna be a little bit more, you know, have a little more ability to do it. So I, I you know, like I said, I talked to you this week about concerns there, but I, I think we just need to just do what we need to do to get those down right away and just use the COVID fund money. So. Yeah, and, and we met with the principals yesterday in order to kind of like look at that because part of our concern was do we have classrooms to kind of so we talked about um, what are what's currently available. That's kind of like an easy fill for those because I'm, I'm anticipating the same thing. You'll probably end up seeing about um, six 
positions that we're going to add um, coming up here. When we did the elementary the last round, we actually held a list of good candidates that we didn't. So we can go back to those people. Um, we were looking at could we possibly do some, again, maybe depending on secondary enrollment, are there some teachers that we can move down in order to cover that? So we met with them just yesterday. And so that's what okay. our goal is basically to pop those sections in, in the head. Okay. So you're not gonna you're not gonna wait another two weeks. You're no, not trying you'll to see them probably for approval in two weeks, but yeah, we'll okay. we'll, we'll that's what I want to make sure I have. After talking with you about it, I'm not too concerned, but I just want to at least bring that forward mm -hmm. that that's that's important, especially with the COVID funds available. Yeah. Like I said in the past, we may not have that opportunity, but certainly and if with everybody recognizing maybe next year we might not be able to do that, but yeah. we should, you know, the year after we put a lot of strain on both staff and students that Absolutely. Those are my two comments. Great, thanks. Um, Mr. Moses? Just like to uh, welcome and congratulate all the new hires um, and uh, forward to start of a good, see, good school year and uh, work through some of these issues and uh, come out running. Okay. Um, so, legislative update, Phil, I don't know if you have. Yeah, there's only there's a couple things. One, um, as part of new legislation for Great Start Readiness, we did, Cone County is receiving 2,500 more GSRP slots. We will get an allocation um, hopefully in the next week or two because the goal is we have to fill those slots based off the allocation or else they'll take those and they'll allocate them elsewhere in the state. And we, we're kind of pushing this egg. We need to know because it's, it's getting close. Um, other than that, they are expecting, um, we're supposed to do the kindergarten reading assessment. This is something they put off, but then it was eliminated in the budget. So we're waiting on a letter to kind of, so that that's just another assessment that hopefully will go away and then we'll be um, set for, for that. So that's, those are the only two pressing things right now. Okay. And usually we will add a board committee update, but because of the summer break, we have not had uh, any committees meet since the last meeting. Um, so now we're going to move to points of pride. Did you want to explain yeah. uh, what you wanted? Point, points of pride are basically, it's a good way to end the meeting and anything that if you want to um, recognize somebody, anybody that you share will take your comments and then we actually shared we'll have cards and she'll put those comments in and we will deliver it to those people so that they can see kind of that they were, if they couldn't watch the meeting that they know that um, it's kind of like an ad boy or ad girl and all that then we'll make sure that they have it. So it's if you have anything that you'd like to highlight or share with people, then we'll do that now. Okay, um, I'll start. And um, I just wanted to, I know the, the band had invited um, board members to, to come and watch. I was not able, um, I was on vacation at the time. Um, but uh, so from my point of pride, I was able to see from um, friends and others that you know shared on Facebook um, was for Mr. Mr. Flory, our new band director, um, and the great job he did uh, coming right in this summer. I know he, you know, he jumped right in in June and got band camp going, and um, the band looked phenomenal to me. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you um, for all your hard work through the summer on that, and um, for the great job, um, and for for our band students as well. And anybody else can jump right in. Yeah, my uh, my points of pride. Uh, you know, I I was uh, like Ms. Brickmeyer said, uh, I was able to attend the uh, the Anchor Bay marching band uh, uh, concert. I want to thank them for inviting me. Um, it was a great performance, excellent job. I was very impressed. It was the first time that I ever uh, was attended one of an event like that. Um, it was great. You know, Mr. Flory did a great job. Mr. Fenton also did a great job. Um, you know, hundred and I believe hundred and sixty seven students. Um, you know, Mr. Braun, like Mr. Braun mentioned, you know, the stands are packed. It was, you know, it was great atmosphere. Um, you know, the students were very engaged. You can see, uh, you know, hard work, you know, for that week paid off. So, you know, great job to them. I can't, uh, can't, you know, say how great uh, it was. Uh, I wish they could do it every, uh, every weekend. It was a great concert. Thank you. All right, well, that is it for our agenda. Um, I will take the motion to adjourn. I'll make the motion. Is there a second?
Aye. I will second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Um, meeting adjourns at 8.08.